I'm on the floor looking at the ceiling. And I'm like, oh, I'm aired out. I'm full aired out. And I'm like, whoa, what in the world? And I'm like, hey, he's like, are you okay? Are you okay, Lee? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm good. And I look at my boss, and stunt coordinator, Bob Brown. He goes, hey, man, you good? What's up? No, no, my bad. My fault. I, I thought something. It's okay. I'm ready to go. Do it again. Take two. Same thing. Comes up to that spot. Boom. Bam. I'm on the floor. And he looks down at me. And I'm like, it's okay. My, guys, I'm so sorry. And, you know, Bob Brown's like, dude, what are you doing? It's take two. You know, you know what's what's going on? Take three, same thing. And I get aired out again and I look up and I saw the little twinkle in Jackie's eye. I'm like, oh, he goes, he goes, Lee, you okay? Why you cry? Come on, man. <laughs> I'm old man, you young, let's go. And I'm like, this guy, he was messing with me. It's my first day of actually fighting him on camera and he was just messing with me. So I'm like, okay, I got it. Obviously take four. He went to throw an ax kick. I just took the reaction back. I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You I'm like, this is an interview with Lee Whitaker. Lee is a stuntman, stunt coordinator, and action director known for many films in India. He talks about his work with Jackie Chan and Samuel Hung, the differences between Indian action and Bollywood, Tollywood, and Mollywood, and we talk a lot about India. Thanks for taking time to talk to me. Uh, Absolutely. If you look at it, um, Kalari, which was from Kerala, right? Um, they say that that's the oldest martial arts on the planet, uh, which is like it's well over three thousand years old, I guess, right now. And when you watch some of that that style and how it's done, you you can kind of see kung fu influences from that. You can see capoeira influence that kind of come through that from the little bit of the dance and some of the art form of that as well um not as quite as polished as you as you would say like a modern um avenger kind of vibe because as we, as we look at avengers comic book styles or even john wick is more clean you know staccato kind of stuff like that where there's is a little bit more fluided and loose and stuff from kind of an outsider's perspective has it changed like does it does it change as an art or does it is not it just really like it really hasn't evolved. Like you can look at you can look at different styles of martial arts from from Taekwondo to to Kung Fu and all the different um, Chinese styles, right? But you know, you look at the the Wushu how it how it's evolved into a more of a beautiful fluid dance, right? Kalari, uh, Kalari if, if you look at it even today, the practitioners of that and the methodology and how that how that progresses, right? How they go through. Um, their training, they go through their weapons. And then uh, finally, after the, after all the weapons are done, after all that training's done, then they get into the practice of healing the body. Because like, so they start learning how uh, the different points on the body that could be healed because they get injured so much through their training and stuff like that. And also when they get into warfare. So they're learning um, pressure points, body massages, stuff like that, which is really quite interesting. I don't know any other martial art that does that. You know, I think dancers are the only ones that actually take care of their bodies more than, than yeah. the martial arts side. Yeah. Which I learned through, um, I did a, my first show was George Lucas Super Live Adventure. And that show had a mixture between stunt people and dancers. So we had like 30 something dancers. And through that, we learned the power of stretching and massage and everybody gives each other's massages and all that other stuff and how important that was for the body to remain at that athletic level and from what i understand about kalari is that it also has a i mean it's almost like entirely spiritual in some ways right oh yeah so. well it came from i forget what lord it was but you're right it's highly spiritual into hinduism and stuff like that um and and where that kind of derived from you know they're so big on their on their spiritualism over there when it comes to that the indian culture whether from the north or south it's heavily about spirituality and stuff like that, which is really cool that they still have such a grip on that. They're honest about it. hundred percent. And, you know, sometimes, you know, whereas like we as a culture uh, from the state side, we hide certain things, you know, we, we, we keep inside. We just don't say it over there. No, they'll just say it, which is kind of refreshing. You know what I mean? And, and they say it with couth, but um, they just tell you how it is, which is really, really cool. And I've been a part of like the Mahabharata and learning about the Mahabharata and all this other stuff. And it's cool to finally see their 
their entertainment industry, their cinema, finally at a level where they can start to expand with that. Because it's the oldest literature on the planet. You know what I mean? They haven't had an opportunity to bring that to life, to bring that story. They've done it many a times, but the technology was never there. The CG was never there, right? Or the money to get the proper CG. So they're finally starting to break into that right now, which is kind of cool to see. So before cinema, though, how did they express those stories? Not just, I mean, I mean, obviously you could have had just the bards and the bard role in India is very important. We had a bard on set uh, yeah. when I did my movie and I saw him go at it once. He started telling stories. It was like, whoa, this guy's like in like a profession as a bard, you know? So uh, was there was there some kind of like theater at the time as well where they could kind of act these still things today, out? Still today. So, you know, they have so many festivals throughout the year. You know what I mean? So they're constantly having festivals and still doing theater and dance and celebrations and parades and stuff like that on each of those, you know? Um, whereas here, it's not as common. I guess. I mean, I guess we have Ren Fairs and um, Shakespeare festivals and whatnot, but it's all a little bit, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you look at the Easter Bunny, I mean, I mean, it's like, oh, yeah. It's not even a comparison, even though it's a national holiday. You look yeah, at, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But over there, you have the, the Festival of Lights and Diwali and stuff like this. It has so much culture and meaning yeah. in it. Um, it's really kind of cool to see that a culture still alive within their festivals and their beliefs, you know. With at these theaters, I mean, would they would they reenact battles and were there theater stuntmen that pr were yeah. These professional? Yeah, there are. They're, yeah, just like we have live shows over here, they still have uh, little live shows over there as well. You know, they'll put on the theater for that, like the Kalar. You do, they'll come out there with the sticks and the swords and the belt. I know you're familiar with the the belt sword, which is really cool, interesting. Uh, piece of technology and it was really cool too because when the british first invaded them and, and um uh kerala they were getting the butts kicked because they just weren't used to that kind of warfare you know what i mean who knew what a sword could flap like that and attack you do you know if, was there a history of these performers like is there for example you have shakespearean sword fencers that have this hundreds of years of fencing training for theater was there some kind of role of a theatrical performer like that I don't know if, if they go around and, and I mean, obviously the biggest battle that we know about within their culture is the Mahabharata. It was a really spectacular um, battle. It was like 15 days or something like that. Um, uh, I would imagine they probably do something like that. Um, I don't know if Kalari did they do in Kerala. I always go back to Kerala because it's, it's the founder of it. Right. So I always go back to that, but you know, there's big battles that go along with, like I say, the Mahabharata, you go, I constantly go back to that and the levels of what that story is about, you know? Yeah, I mean, you made two of the biggest movies of all time based on that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're starting thousands of years ago. Eventually, we'll get to your, your, your starting stunts. But uh, <laughs> I appreciate the context because what, what, I, what I couldn't quite figure out when I was there, um, there were stunt schools. Right. Um, now, I was, in, uh, I was working in uh, Mumbai. So, okay. a different. and the uh, frankly, I didn't find the local performers to be very good. They right. couldn't, they couldn't react. Um, right. They couldn't fight, even though they had black belts in martial arts. They they couldn't punch. They couldn't kick. And at the stunt school, I was trying to figure out, like, well, what are they training? It seemed like they're training impacts, wires, uh, cowboy stunts. I see a lot of cowboy stunts in which you do as well. Can you talk at all about? Where are these old school stunt guys in India? Like what what they were training? So they their influence is all you know like ours. They, it came from the Chinese theater, right? So that was a, an influence, and then also the the westerns that we did, and you can still see see that today. You can see those reactions today. You can see the over top eighties style, big you know flamboyant action and stuff like that. Um, it's starting to shift now. Uh, which is kind of cool to watch and to be a part of that. Um, but even for me, when I would go over there, you know, to find certain, you know, guys to be on the team and, and, and give me what I need, you know, literally happen to teach them during the day how to do those reactions. Because what they do is like their masters, they call them masters over there, which is like your stunt coordinator, right? Because you're the master of your craft. They're just listening to that guy and, and just giving what they need. 
and the master sets it up and then you know the director they always you know they obviously hired that guy so they believe in that vision and that's what they're ended up coming out with when they start bringing in foreigners over here we're giving them a shift so it's a shift change and i've been there since 2011 and that's like 10 years now and i'm starting to finally see the shift happening which is kind of cool um but the other thing too is you look at training and their training over there is quite different than our training over here. So when you're training into stunts in action over here, when you're not working, you're training, you're at the gym, you're at a gymnastics facility, you're in the weight room to protect your body with your muscle tissue, you're stretching, you're out in the park fighting with your buddies or in some kind of training facility. So you're getting sh you know sharp on those skills whether it be fight choreo, your reactions, trampoline, so on and so forth. Over there, I've been trying to talk these guys into doing this for a long time, sending them stuff on, on Instagram and stuff like that. I'm like, look, you don't need a facility. you got a park. you got a beach. Get out there and train and try to stay sharp and, and, and make sure that you're keeping your eyes and your, your thumb on the pulse of what's happening within your cinema. It's important, otherwise you'll be left behind. I have a funny anecdote uh, about uh, some, you know, auditioning guys, and you've been through this too, I'm sure. You audition, you know, a hundred guys in a day a lot of the time, and and when we were auditioning guys, like I said, the locals weren't very good, but then every now and then there'd be a dude that looked like he was Thai or Chinese, but they're Indian, right? They're from Assam, Nagaland, yep. um, Nepal. Yep. And these guys sometimes spoke no English, but they could wipe the floor with everybody else in there yeah. not only were they just physically just better and they were like their vocabulary was better um but they also when we ended up hiring all those guys and we had like a set of eight dudes and there were some locals in there too um in between takes these guys were over shooting their own indie films like stealing <laughs> shots on the location i was like that's how you do it guys like see them <laughs> i was just pointing like see them right now they're yeah. just practicing and they're making a video yeah. that's yeah. how you learn yeah that's it uh, we were in Tbilisi, Georgia, filming. It was an Indian movie we were filming, and we had some Ukrainian guys come over, right, on our team because it was a, again, it was a film that was British against the Indians, um, and the Ukrainians and the Russian guys that were over there in between takes. They, again, like like you said, they were shooting their stuff, they were training, they would grab a mat, practice reactions, and stuff like that. You know, they're not sitting on their cell phones on Instagram or anything like that. You know what I mean? Which is kind of refreshing. You worked on Rangers a lot. Did you work with Isaac on Rangers? Or yeah, Florentine. Yeah, <laughs> I first worked with Isaac on uh, WMAC Masters. Okay, yeah, yeah. That was like that was pretty much the beginning of uh, a lot of a Floridian guys uh, uh, of our our kind of creation of it all before we moved to LA. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Tell me about the Florida scene. So Florida scene was here. You had like Disney and you had Universal Studios and you had all these live shows. And, you know, they, they were very big live shows, a big Wild West show. They had a big Lagoon boat, boat stunt show that was like Miami Vice with these big scarab boats. It was really amazing. And same with Disney. You had the Indiana Jones show and all this other stuff. All these shows required a high level of skill set because you're doing all these shows repetitive day in and day out. And you don't want to get hurt, blah, blah, blah. The scene started to grow so much. And everybody was such a family that you know again we were just like oh the big the big dream is to go to cali to go to la you know to be in the movies you know so we were always training always training to sharpen our skill set and our craft so that we could get out there and then all of a sudden there was talks about oh florida is going to be the next la because of the studios that disney's building universal's building right but because of taxes and the weather over there it just never happened you know you're raining every day you know, you're shutting down production for two three hours <clears throat> that's a big issue so we all kind of started there man and uh i remember Demi wmac masters came through and uh they hired me uh because i could take mad reactions that was my thing i would make those guys look so good i just I, that's what i was learning in clint wilder's backyard who was one of the founders of stunts unlimited you know was uh was isaac in florida at the time i know he's there now he was so wmac masters was in florida that was in orlando this is a new piece of history for me that I, I really appreciate mm -hmm. knowing about this. What were you guys training in stunts? I mean, you're, you're, this is sure. like holistic stunts, right? This is like yeah, totally. style stunts. Like what, what were you pulling from Chinese and also Western stunts? Oh, for sure. Um, because there were everything was so different. So 
obviously when we all first started the wild west fight style was very prominent you know the big rear back throw punch big reaction everything was kind of big as far as that we would train that we would get into your high fall training on towers and, and hitting porta pits and stuff like that mini tramp was an amazing tool for air awareness which then translated over to the air ramps yeah. and then when jim churchman started to redesign the air ram it took it to the whole next level because the first air rams they were so small it was like a shotgun it's gonna blow your leg off you don't hit it right and then jim churchman and nick brandon built a progressive one you hit that and it was so soft and then it boop and then you're, we were like launching 20 30 feet you know um but we were doing that uh we were picking up uh some of the guys were big into Kung Fu there. I forget the name of that school there. So we were getting into Kung Fu to learn that style. I was a big Taekwondo guy because I just loved, I love the kicks and that backspin hook kick. You know, when the first time I saw JJ Perry throw a backspin hook kick, I'm like, that guy could break a tree down. It just blew my mind. You know what I mean? Um, there was a rumor he could kick the head off of a parking meter. I wouldn't not, doubt it, man. Not confirmed, that, but... Dude, between well, because I was hanging out with him, Clay Barber, and Tim Connolly. And Clay was like the first 720, whatever it was, guy, you knocked the cigarette out of your mouth. Right. And then Connolly and Perry, Perry, JJ had such these big thighs. His quads were so massive. It just looked like so much power. I would never want to get hit by that. No thanks. Break my body in half. Skip up. <laughs> you know. Um so we were getting into that. So we were trying to make sure that we're learning all these different styles so that when work came in, we had a, a, a proper vocabulary and a library of skill sets. And then we'd learn rigging, stunt rigging, whether you're on the wire, flying on the wire, or you're actually rigging the wire or you're pulling because you can learn a lot pulling as you do riding, right? Comes hand in hand. Uh, and then we're obviously learning uh, some driving and, and stuff like that and fire and boats and underwater. So it was constant. It was constant. And the community was just growing and growing. And then there was a big migration out to L.A. in like 90, 94, 95. I think we pissed off a lot of uh, Californians when we first came out there. They're like, who are these, you know, Floridian guys coming in here? And, well, you know, we just came with no egos, just big eyed and want to work and want to train and have fun, you know. I guess the Texans were going out there, too. Because Clayton and J.J. were Texas guys. And uh, so when you came out to to uh west coast you're in the replacement killers martial law there's this sort of influx of hong kong guys coming in just like right after the floridians right well you had you had rush hour pop out right so that was like a big deal and then you had then the tv shows were starting to do it buffy the vampire slayer you know when you had pruitt and sophie over there bringing in that the hong kong feel because she was 100 percent hong kong jeff was inundated in, in Hong Kong. So everything we did on Buffy the Vampire Slayer was, was Hong Kong style. And this is stuff we were getting into in Florida when we had first moved out here. And then um, and then martial law. I mean, when I got on martial law, uh, Samo loved me. This was a bucket list for me to fight that guy. He called me monkey boy because he could throw me in anything because I'm a little guy. I mean, I learned a choreo really good and boom, you know, it was awesome. Man, he was fun. Any, uh, any Samo stories to... To recall I, I love I, I i swear i've probably i've done like 35 of these interviews and probably 10 of them have a story about samo well i remember when we were down we are in some park doing i don't know god knows what episode we were doing and um he was on he, he had a, he had somebody come out on the the p bars or something like that in this park fight that we did and i think at, at some point we had some kind of weird blooper out after the fact he missed some choreo and just started punching me in the crotch <laughs> you know what I mean? And it was hilarious. And they used it in one of the outtakes of that episode, man. It was just hilarious. But I just remember so many times just you get in the room with him and his boys and it's super quiet. And, and then they'll start choreographing stuff. And then uh, monkey boy, come. And I come over there and do this, da 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 and then change. Oh no, do this and da da da. I'll put him on wire, you know, throw him over a table or whatever. Um but working with him. And the boys kind of gave me the confidence for my ultimate bucket list. And that was working with Jackie. Did you find that you had to break any habits when working with Samo and the Hong Kong guys? 
Not at all, because I, at that time, me and some of my friends were so inundated in the style. Because if you look at the style of that martial art, it isn't, it's completely different than 8711 style. Okay. And in, in, in the rhythm of it. And it's a rhythm. Pop, 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 pop. It's like trapping, trapping drills, right? Da, 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 da. You know, and it's got a rhythm to it. And you had to make sure that you had that speed and rhythm and the acting to go in it. You can't just throw that fist out there or that back fist without having the intensity in that. And we were training so much of, of that. It was just like eat, breathe, sleep it. So it wasn't really hard. It's just, we just wanted to please them so bad. We wanted the shot. You know what I mean? And we knew how some of the other stunt guys that would come in that weren't familiar with that style. It was very frustrating. It was frustrating for the stunt guys. It was frustrating for Samo and their team. And, you know, we could see that, you know, and even the stunt guys were trying, but they just didn't have that. I don't, I, it's kind of like a light switch. You know what I mean? And you're a, you're a martial artist, you understand, but when to get into that kind of speed and timing, you got to be able to flip that switch and go and understand that rhythm. I just think some of the guys that they just didn't get it. They weren't fast enough. What do you think that translation gap entails, Lee? You know, you watch a John Wayne fight sometimes and th that, that kind of like scratches a nice itch for me as well. It's kind of like a wrecking ball. Sure. It's a little bit different, right? But then yeah. watching a Hong Kong movie, it was like I was watching a symphony. Right. Right. Like compared to a wrecking ball. What do you think that, like, what was that switch for you? I think it, I think it basically came down to the, the conductor, the, the architect, you know what I mean? Whoever's in charge, whoever's designing. So as long as they're communicating properly, okay, this is going to be this kind of fight because this guy's six foot five. You already know, you know what I mean? What kind of fight the, the that's going to be, but like if I'm going to go work out with Clay and those guys, it's going to be a different kind of fight. I understand that because they're the architect. They're they're the conductor. So I think it was understanding the language of whoever is the fight choreographer or in charge in the moment. You know what I mean? We'll get together as a group. Okay, this guy's in charge. Do, you know, 20 beat choreo. All right, great. Now let's switch it up. Now the next person's in charge. You know, you come up with it. And they should all have a different style and rhythm to it. And I think by training with guys that thought like that it allowed you to adapt faster to the understanding of what it was mm -hmm. you know what i mean because you got some stunt guys that just come on on set for the day especially on buffy so you come on the on the set of buffy or angel right and you don't have pre -vis. you don't have prep days you show up you do it you know what i mean they give the give them like a, an hour ahead of time pre-call and you're going to learn like 45 beats or whatever it's going to be. You just got to be sharp, you know, and that's kind of where we came from. Whereas now I feel like some of the stunt guys are slightly spoiled where, man, you get like seven days to learn choreo or whatever it is, you know? So I think it's just understanding the language of whoever is designing, you know, and, and if you can adapt into that yeah. and switch into that. Mm -hmm. And then it's also, I think, the whoever's in charge of that to be able to communicate back to the paint. You know what I mean? Because that's what you are. You're paint for their canvas. And as long as they can communicate properly and respectfully within that, it makes you want to work harder and understand what they're trying to achieve. Hey, this was good going boom, 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 but put like a half a beat in between the two and show a bigger reaction. You know what I mean? It's hmm. like if you're going to get on set with Avengers, that fight's going to be different than it is going to be on, on something di uh, bigger. You know what I mean? And I think the best, I think the time that I got to see kind of the two kind of come at it was Fast 8. Uh, I don't remember which one it was. But you had The Rock, you had Dwayne fighting Statham. And Statham kind of had that 87 style and a little bit of Jackie style getting into the 87. So it's a little bit of that mix because he had the timing, but he had a little bit more power on top of it. You know what I mean? So when you saw him fighting Dwayne, in that sequence, you could see the big Arnold style and the big wrestler style. And then you could see also the more our style, the more martial arts kind of like. I thought that was a pretty cool combo. Hey, I just wonder like where that 87 style comes from. I've been trying to put my finger on it. Well, you look at like, I mean, you look at Chad and Dave, right? And I uh, say so you use Chad, Dave, Marcus, JJ, you know, uh, Clay and Tim and all those guys. Most of those guys are Taekwondo. So, you know, they're, they're 
foundation is Taekwondo. So you might be onto something there. I personally don't know. Um, but it that does make some sense. Whereas you look at like Jackie, he's he's all over the place. He's fluid. And that's what I loved about him. When he gets into an environment, use the environment. Don't just stay in one spot and fight. And I, I've taken on that within my own choreo and the action design that I do, especially if I have a beautiful room, I'm looking at what I can destroy and how I can get around that room. So that also I love cinematography and that is so embedded into my brain about a shot. So I want to see the travel into those locations so I can get beautiful shots at the same time, you know? If I stay yeah. straight, you know what I mean? I'm never going to get that. I'm only going to get that. Yeah. You know, and then maybe a wide profile. Do you have any stories of Jackie uh, improvising and coming up with choreography on uh, Spy Next Door? That's when you do with him. Are you right? kidding me right now? This guy. I have so many good stories on Jackie in that, in that movie. I was so stressed daily. I don't think I ever, in my whole career, I remember getting to lunch each day and even rehearsal days just getting to lunch and what's that smell oh that's me i was so stressed that i was sweating so bad and i was stinky from that sweat that nervousness right uh but we were learning like 75 80 beats and we show up and you got to be quiet you're in the back of the room like this and we all get into the environment, and Jackie and his boys, they, they'll be walking around for four hours, just figuring it out, just figuring it out. And you just, you, you're back there quiet. And then you're watching all these moves, and I'm like, okay, there's like 80, 85 something moves. And, and I had to double two different characters in the movie, and I'm fighting him each in each one. And I, I mean, I'm talking like it's one thing to just watch them choreo it, but to be a part of the choreo, it's easier to, you know, to remember because it's, you know, body awareness, right? Were you were you it's, doubling it's, it's the weird. the guy in the blue jacket? Were you doubling him? Correct. The main yeah. villain. Yeah. I doubled the main villain. And then I did uh, I doubled the kid in uh, also the kid, uh, the love interest in the very beginning when they're in the, the um, Asian uh, restaurant. Right. And that was my first fight with Jackie was in that, that restaurant. And I remember like, okay, they, they mapped it out. And then we, and he just came up to me. Like, okay. We're going to get in now. And I'm going to start to work on some choreo. He goes, just tap me on the shoulder. He goes, don't worry. Tomorrow I'll change. And then they left. And I'm like, Hey man, <laughs> we didn't have like, you can't have cell phones where you can just like record what they're doing and like go back in the hotel and practice and all this other stuff. So I'm stressed out. We have yeah, how, did they, how did they even remember anything? So the next day you go to a rehearsal place, right? And so you're going to rehearse and it's already changed. Like those guys got together that night, changed it already. So I show up and, and they're, they're working on the core, they're working on the choreo. And then they're like, hmm. And they changed it again. I mean, like for four days in a row, and finally on day three, I got in, start doing choreo, start doing choreo. Lee, don't stress. No, no worry. Tomorrow it changed. Sure enough, day of shoot changed. I'm like, oh my God. So I was so stressed, man. And then I remember we got to the section where we're fighting. I pick up a knife and he's got to you know, kick the knife out of my hand and do a push kick. And when he does a push front kick, right, I go over a table and then over another table and then out through this glass window. But each time that we came up to that push kick, boom, he blocks that knife out with his foot as a crescent kick, boom, and goes for the push, push kick. He's doing an axe kick on my chest. I'm on the floor looking at the ceiling. And I'm like, oh, I'm aired out. I'm full aired out. And I'm like, whoa, what in the world? And I'm like, hey, he's like, are you okay? Are you okay, Lee? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm good. And I look at my boss, the stunt coordinator, Bob Brown. He goes, hey, man, you good? What's up? No, no, my bad. My fault. I, I thought something. It's okay. I'm ready to go. Do it again. Take two. Same thing. Comes up to that spot. Boom. Bam. I'm on the floor. And he looks down at me. And I'm like, it's okay. My, guys, I'm so sorry. And, you know, Bob Brown's like, dude, what are you doing? It's take two. You know, you know what's what's going on? Take three, same thing. And I get aired out again and I look up and I saw the little twinkle in Jackie's eye. I'm like, oh, he goes, he goes Lee, you okay? Why you cry? Come on, man. <laughs> I'm old man, you young, let's go. And I'm like, this guy, 
he was messing with me. It's my first day of actually fighting him on camera, and he was just messing with me. So I'm like, okay, I got it. Obviously, take four. He went to throw an axe kick. I just took the reaction back. I didn't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Did you I'm respect like, you after that? <laughs> Did you respect you after that? <laughs> yeah, and that was like the beginning of it, man. And after that, like I, they were just—he was testing me out to see how my mentality mentality was going to be, how quick I could learn, and how I was going to deal with it. And every fight we fight we did after that, we just clicked. I mean, I just that was my timing. That was my jam. You know what I mean? Back then. And I remember when we finished the show, you know, we had a big dinner because, you know, he always wanted to have dinner every night. And there's another story beyond for that. And uh, and uh, I just remember him toasting me. Uh, which that really meant a lot to me because he liked my timing. He was like, it's all about timing. And and you're one of the very few Americans that have that kind of timing for a white boy. And I was like, that's really cool. That's cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. That's a, that's a good story. Yeah. It's kind of that um, I'm reading a book about um, Beijing opera right now. And in mm-hmm. uh, the way that that whole process works. And I imagine that like in Beijing opera, it's like, if you've got a show, you're probably going to be coming up with stuff the night before and changing stuff on the fly. And that must just be how those guys work, man. Cause the Hong yeah. Kong stuntmen are just like version two of Beijing opera and Cantonese. Right. hundred percent. Well, that's where he came from. That's where Jackie came from. You know, um, he, he came from that whole vibe. I, I think what I kind of liked about the lesson of it was like our business in filmmaking, it's an ebb and flow constantly. Everything's changing constantly. You never, Nothing solid. Even when you write the script, it's going to change and go through so many renditions. You know what I mean? And it's how that if you try to fight that, you're going to lose or you're not going to survive in the business, you know, and that's just life because life is a constant evolution. So it's how you mold with it and, uh, and go with that, because if you are open to that, you could come up with something that's just brilliant and legendary. But if you restrict that, you'll never get there. Drunken Master 2. Those guys changed that thing so many times. I remember being in a hotel with him, drinking, smoking cigars. He goes, it took me over a month to get that. You know, but because we just, just ebb and flow. We, they had the freedom then, financially. Yeah. You know what I mean? Did he have that kind of time on Spy Next Door? Not really. I mean, I knew that he wanted more time. Um I, I, you know, you, you could see the, I don't, I don't know. It's hard. It's always hard to have these certain conversations with, uh, with the business, but as far as like the director of the film, checking in, checking out kind of vibe, you know, and just not understanding the fight and the process of that. I mean, you can kind of see it in the filmmaking. Cause when I saw that movie, I was like, this is a really good Jackie Chan movie with like the wrong editing. Yeah. Everything else was like, then this is this is Jackie Chan, but it's just like it's like it, you know, the framing is just, I don't know. And that was some of his battle, you know, is getting in there with the with the the camera guys and you know the director and, and your DP and stuff like that. Because when you're going to get into a Jackie film, let Jackie do Jackie. You know what I mean? And you should let him sit in on that edit as well. You know, bring that editor in at the end of the day or whatever. Let, let him see what the cut is. Let Listen to his notes. And I think, too, like when you talk about shows like Buffy and they were letting they were letting Jeff Pruitt get in on Buffy on some of the editing in the beginning. You know what I mean? But I think that's important, especially with Samuel and Martial Law. Let those guys in on that edit and you're going to get that feel and it's going to be it's going to work. Yeah. It's when you don't is when it's going to collide. You would have thought that after Rush Hour 2, which is like a masterpiece, like they would have figured that out where it's like, OK, well, Jackie has a rhythm to his action. We're not going to shoot it like like we just shot a TV show. We're going right. to shoot it like the way Jackie wants to shoot it. But I guess that and every every show has got its own showrunner, though, right? <laughs> it does. And, and you're also looking at time and budget, you know what I mean? But, you know, and then you got ultimately where the ego steps in. So, you are you know, if you've got to tiptoe your own personal ego, just stand aside and let the guy be the master of what he's doing. Let him do that. Let him tell you where the camera goes. You know what I mean? He's going to know what's best. And if you have an idea, but like, hey, what do you think about this, though, instead? And he's going to give you his opinion. Because 
I think that's what was missing in a lot of times still today is like you need to make sure that you get in like your camera guys. Don't just put up three cameras on your shoulders and leave it to your editor to get your shots. It doesn't work like that. Listen to your action guys. They know action. They know how to capture it the best way possible. So when they do a previs, try not to go, hey, you just shoot it flat. We'll decide where the camera goes. Okay, well, you're missing the mark now. And that's why now we're starting to direct movies. I had the same thing happen uh, where uh, on Altered Carbon, I previs the um, the first fight in the hotel. But I realized, well, first of all, the director came for about two hours. It was a week long previs at um, 87. <clears throat> and um, and I never, of course, in my dreams would have ever met the DP because DPs tend not to come to previs. Were you able to make headway in America with previs and getting getting production on your side to kind of take your vision into consideration? Yes and no. And here's where here's where that fine line is. If you have a newer director, okay, up and coming, new director, like new to action, new to that, and a DP that's new to that, then, and you're also talking to the producer, he's bringing you in because of your knowledge, he's already prefacing those guys, listen to him. Now you're in a conversation. Be like, hey, guys, this is what I do. I love to do. I want your feedback. As long as this guy, too, doesn't have the ego like a brick wall, be like, no, it's my show. It's my game. You can't do that either. So it's just working together to, to, to get to that. When it's that pubescent of a period, you're, you're going to be able to, to fly with it because you're essential and a vital tool to production and money, right? Let me pre-visit. Boom, boom, boom. You got some suggestions on the day. Let's, let's go for it as long as we're on time, we can do that. And that's when it rocks. When you start getting into the higher up stuff, nah, you're 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 dealing with, you know, if you're on a Marvel film or whatever, most of the time it's already animatic. It's already done, yeah. It's already done. So there and I see a lot of my friends get frustrated because you know, where's the creativity in that? Where's the collaboration in that? You know, you have amer amazing performers and rigging teams and, and coordinators and action designers, you know, or, or you got these guys in a cubicle trying to just come up with, you, you know what I mean? Trust your guys, let, and but guide them. Yeah. You know, you're going to yeah. come up with some really substantial stuff. Yeah. I and mean, that's one of the conversations we're always having in games now, which is, uh, get us in on the animatic process so that yes. we can work with your DP. And that that's what we did on God of War Ragnarok. That really helped sort of like streamline it. Because not only not only were we able to, you know, act on our action vision, but we actually understood what the DP wanted. Right. And we get into his head. Because the thing is, like a lot of the time, DPs also, maybe they're, maybe sometimes they have an ego because they're trying to figure it out too. And they just want to figure it out. I mean, that, what you just described is the best situation because then you get the DP's knowledge. Yes. And then you're like, then you have art, <laughs> right? A hundred percent, man. And that's why I've spent the better part of my past 10, 15 years trying to understand the DP's, DP's mentality. If I can get into his head and I can give him what he wants faster because he's trying to create art in every frame. You know what I mean? So if I can read that and I don't think just about my choreo, or how cool the action is, but how to capture it. And that's where the money is. You know what I mean? At least the joy of the money, the shot. I'm like, oh, it's amazing. What I loved about um, Power Rangers and what Isaac did was he would he would sort of take that step when he would work with the DP so closely yeah. to make sure that his action was executed the way that it need to, needed to be done. Right. Do you have, I mean, when, when did you find that that, relationship clicked the in a particular film in america or a show i think most most of that click happened in india when when you got sent over there you know if you go over there thinking you're just a stunt coordinator if you're going over there as a stunt coordinator wrong <laughs> they're gonna hand you, you a go, Mr. Lee. Yeah. Here's your director's seat <laughs> here's your director's chair Goodbye. here's the microphone let us know what we're gonna do and you're like whoa okay Big boy pants, put them on, you know? And I think that's because we were already, I was already doing previous before that, but, you know, we were kind of held back a little bit, but it was the, it was when it was first starting to happen. You know what I mean? Like in 05 to 08, you know, we were getting pretty heavy in pre-biz and pre-visualization. Chad, 
killed it on the 300 and just really opened the door wide open for everybody in the industry, which was so helpful because now it, you need it so much. And I, and I try to stress that to every production, um, why you need pre -biz. you know, same reason why you need animatic. But I think India had a lot to do with it because they expect you to do everything. Whereas in the States at that time, you know, it, you just do the choreo, you show up, you teach the people, whatever, and then they're going to figure out how they're going to shoot it. You know, it was rare that you got to do that unless, again, you're with some newbies you know, some newer uh, directors and DPs. So that that pretty much clicked for me, you know, and even when we were, did uh, Abraham Lincoln, the Vampire Hunter, um, that was a battle for us because we were battling the Russians. They had already done, Timor had a team in Russia. Oh, Timor did? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, so we saw all their pre right? And we're just like, oh, that's, it was too dated. It was too jacky. It was to that time. If you look at the cyclical, everything evolves and changes, right? It just wasn't in. And so we were He's a pure that. Jackie guy. He's, he's a Jackie guy. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, and a lot of times I've, I've done some films recently in India. When I got an action star, unlike the States, he can move. He can fight. He's amazing. He wants to do Jackie. I'm my like, brother. I'm trying to make him state them. I'm like... You need to see the evolution of your cinema and where, where it's heading right now. I know you love Jackie. I love Jackie. You know what I mean? We all love Jackie and we will always pay our homage to him. It's different right now. And if you don't hop on board, you're going to get passed by. And one of the jobs I did, it was just a promo. And I go, I'm, I'm not coming back to the feature. Because I designed some really cool stuff to get this guy to a dope level with guns and all this other stuff. And then he kind of did his acting thing on the set and threw a fit and was like, no, I'm just going to do what I do. I'm going to go boom, 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 kick. You know what I mean? And I'm going to do the Van Damme. And I was just like, okay, you guys do whatever you want, as long as you're happy, but don't call me on the, on the big show. And so, and that's how Bollywood's kind of been for me. That's, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, so I tend to stay in the South. Describe that difference. So your first film was Bollywood. You're saying this promo piece um, you no, know, my first Bollywood film was Thugs of Hindustan. Okay. Yeah, that was my first Bollywood. Um, before that, it was always South. I, you know, there's Bollywood, Hollywood, Tollywood. There's so many of them, you know what I mean? But, you know, you got your Chennai, which is South, and you got your Hyderabad, which is Tamil, or Telugu, sorry, and that's South. You know, then you get down deeper into Kerala and Malayaman and whole different industry. But they all obviously have different payments as well. So... Hyderabad uh, is Telugu, big industry right there. You could Bahubali and all that stuff. That's Telugu, so that's still South. And that that was the first South movie to smash Bollywood in history. You know what I mean? Which was kind of cool to see. You know, because they always treated that like the redheaded stepchild kind of thing, right? Because Bollywood's Bollywood. It's like boom. But if you look at Bollywood right now, it's struggling in a massive way, thinking they can just throw money at it, which we have that mistake as well. That that's going to fix it, but it's not going to fix it. You have to see what the audience is asking for. you got to pay attention to that and give them what they want. Otherwise, they'll just get on their phone and go on YouTube and watch something else. When you went down to the South, and from what I understand, too, you know, Malayana, Mollywood and the Tamil and Telugu cinema, those are like night and day. Night and day. But they're neighbors. That's the crazy thing. It's finance. So you have to look at your ROI, return on investment. OK, so you look got to look at how much it costs to make that movie and what your return is going to be. If you don't even have enough theaters, enough people go into that theater or the cost of the ticket for that theater, you'll never recruit that cost. So you can't even afford that cost. It's not that they don't want to. It's just business. It's finance business. Right. Bollywood, they can get away with that. They got a big audience. Everybody wants to go see Bachchan or whoever that is. So they know that if I got Amitabh Bachchan, I'm going to have this many people watch this movie regardless. You know, we do the same thing over here. All right, if I got Tom Cruise, I'm going to I'm gonna make my money back. You know, Or if you have a streaming service with however many millions of subscribers, no matter what I put on there, they will watch it, which is not panning out as well as they hoped, but Correct. that was the, definitely the assumption. Correct. So that's kind of what's going on over there. Like I'm talking to a, pardon me, a Malayanan film right now. First, uh, first big budget of its kind. 
you know, and, and for me, look, I, I've always been the underdog. I'm a little guy, you know what I mean? So I've always been that Rudy character my whole life. And there's something innate inside me that I will always be that underdog and I will always fight. And when somebody comes to me with a better idea, I don't, they, this show has more money, but this has more heart. I'm going to go with the more heart always. I'm always going to choose that. You know what I mean? So that, you know, I want to help them rise above it. I mean, but who believe was that way? And then boom, who, who knew that that was going to happen? But when I, when I look at like a, like films in Kerala, for example, I almost worked on one. Uh, Vlad ended up doing it. Um, it's much more, these films seem to be more, what, like thriller, a little bit more down to earth, uh, lower budget, obviously. You um, said it right there, down to earth. So it's more real. Why? Um, neighbors. There's something like I did Malik, very low budget. Man, the acting was so good. I remember showing up on set and watching Fahad do a take. And I was just like, this guy can act, man. Why isn't this guy in Hollywood? I mean, that's that was so good. You know, he's not over the top. Most of their acting is way over the top. That some of these South films, it's not. And I just did a movie, uh, VKT, right? With Simbu. His acting was so good. We did a oneer, a true oneer, because I don't like to do wipes, right? And I had to teach this actor how to do a 75, 82 beat fight. Yeah, it's, not, it's great, man. It's crazy. Going through the different levels and yeah, not crazy. kill himself or get hurt by these stunt guys that can get loose. You know what I mean? And for him to be able to remember all that in only a couple of days and then have the, the nuances of the acting inside it, it was just amazing. You know, so I feel like that's a big difference between the markets. Why? I just don't know. Fascinating. You know? It is fascinating. Like I've been trying to figure that out for a while. You look at Malik acting's brilliant. You know what I mean? Well, well done movie. The BKT, same kind of thing. You know, um, Gotham Memon, fantastic director. You know, that movie crushed it. These smaller movies. You know what I mean? I, I, I can't help but love being a part of a smaller movie that's just going to rise above all the stereotypes, you know? Yeah, the, the the film that I I've only done one Indian film, but the one I did as a it was like a two million or three million dollar movie, and it had so much heart. And it was me and Dennis, just two of us going over there, and it was like it was like you said, like once it came time to shoot the action, the director's like, all right, go ahead, and yeah. I was like, whoa, I ended up shot listing, and we ended up doing all like so not just call the actors and then hey, let's go yeah. and practice. It was crazy, but um, but that was in Mumbai. Yeah, um, the tendency with all the stunt guys all the locals and with a lot of the actors everybody kind of the whole culture they really wanted to push toward this like very big extremely big and like almost greek connection there but and dennis and i were always trying to say like no 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 we're we're keeping it like grounded so that we can prove that our actors can just do everything you know right none of these crazy bad and like none of these physics defying things so i always wondered like well why and then when it came to you know i'd look at some malayalam cinema and they did some stuff in the 90s and the 2000s that just looks like hong kong movies it's kind of crazy right. like and like i never heard of these movies super low budget but they look like stuff that was being made in thailand in like 1985 <laughs> yeah totally right <laughs> it's like a weird dichotomy of time I'll watch a movie. I'm like, when was this made? Was this made in the 80s? No, no, sir. This was made three years ago. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that always happens when it comes to vehicles. So if you do any kind of car work over there, and it's only because of the cars and the background that gives you that feel that is dated. Um, I also feel like some of their DPs, but now some of the DPs are getting switched on. You look at some of the stuff that's on Netflix. I mean, it, it just looks beautiful, you know, um, to see them color things like that on the fly so fast. You know, uh, I, I dig it. But yeah, you, you've done some work in Carol, but you've mostly done your work in uh, Tamil Nai, right? Most of, a lot of it in Hyderabad. OK, Hyderabad is one of my favorite places. That's almost like my, my other home. Um, and so in Chennai uh mumbai those are the main ones and then besides that i've done mysore uh um i was just in Kashmir, which was a very sensitive area we're doing a location scout and they're like we should, probably shouldn't be walking through here i'm like why because of uh some organizations there that but i did a boat sequence there and 
I pissed off everybody, you know, because they like I told them, I go, you got to let everybody know you're on all these houseboats and all these house shops. You go, we're, we're going to be flying through here with big wakes. You got to let these people know. And they didn't. And I'm we're flying through there with cameras and stuff. Next thing I know, I got everybody coming outside, throwing dishes at me. And I'm like, bro. How do you anyway. how do you manage safety? Here's the thing, man. It's safety in India is has gotten way better than when I first started. Uh, knock on wood, nobody's been injured, right? Um, you have to always think of the worst case scenario. You know, in the States, you kind of do, but you kind of don't have to. You know what I mean? It's kind of like it's there. There you have to you have to anticipate, okay, is this crane up to specs? Is that thing going to, you know, pop and fall? Because I had that happen once. And that, that anchor popped loose, came down, the ground shook. And I'm like, I'm thinking I'm going to go over there and it's going to be eight Indian guys underneath that thing. It just barely missed one guy. And I'm just like, because the crane operator was running late and his kid, 15 year old, is extending it without hitting the brake release and the cable snapped, the big hook dropped. So <laughs> you just you just never know what's going to happen. You have to always think of every single thing that's going to go wrong so you can avoid that from happening. And it's and I and I tell my wife this too, it's it's very stressful. Working there is really hard. And the longer you stay and work there, the harder it gets because each production is going to be completely different than the other. You got to repeat the whole thing over again. Do you bring your own rigging teams or do you use local teams? Uh, it just depends on what the, I have a great rigging local team there in Mumbai. Um, I have been using them on every single film that I've ever been there. What I usually do is bring uh, one to three guys on the rigging side. If it's rig extensive, like this next one, I'm probably going to bring two. You know what I mean? So I'll bring that. Um, but I'll use my local guys there. They're really, they're really savvy and hard workers and, you know, they're switched on and I always look for that. If, if a guy's switched on or not. If, if you're showing up as a rigger and you got flip flops on, you better go home. <laughs> you better go I, home. I, I was, everybody, everybody's got to go home. <laughs> you all got to go home. But my guy. guys now they show up. They all got tennis shoes on. They got they keep their equipment clean and 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 which is great. There was this guy outside of our hotel room every morning. God bless this guy. Um, I look. I would go out of the hotel room. I'd hear bang 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 and i'd go out and i see it and there's this like new building going up one guy building a warehouse one guy on in flip-flops and he's and he's putting he's putting uh it's not rebar it's like um you know like the like metal it's called a rost it's called a rostrum he's like talking about the mean? scaffolding yeah 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 metal scaffolding alone yeah. and yeah. and and i watched him for a month like like an ant <laughs> building yeah, build his way up yeah it's crazy yeah that's a different there's something different about that kind of thinking which like yeah. in a sense maybe that's lost from it is it's called it's called primitive thinking and my grandfather was a master at it you know uh, i hope i got some of it because that primitive thinking is hey man th they'll build a whole scale you'll see on the side of the scaffolding all out of bamboo just like in china and it works great it's super strong but I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, what do you do? I mean, there's something beautiful about that. But at the same time, how do you, you got to test it, right? You, I mean, I, I assume you go out there and you start shaking it. <laughs> I mean, the good thing is like most of the rostrums now, they have, uh, once it goes in, once it goes inside, it, then it has a thing that clicks on both sides. So it can't come back unless you spin that this way. And then it can release, which is great. But again, you <laughs> you know how we have lunch boxes, not a real lunch box, but like the grip, the electrics, right? And you know, it's where all the things plug into. So you go over there to like their version of a lunch box, it's just wires. And they got rain machine right there. And you're walking by and you're going, that guy right there has a fan. He's blowing, his wires are connected, the rain's coming down. And I'm just like, you guys, you know, it, let's just think about this for a hot second. Is that growing pains, do you think? Um, Yeah, I think it's going to, yeah, 100%. I mean, it's getting there. Their technology is getting better. Their equipment's getting better, right? But it's just growing pains. Like you said, it's cost. It's when, it's when 
finally, whatever, like Hyderabad starts to grow, the cinema grows, right? So then they start getting better equipment. And so that's kind of how it happens. You know what I mean? Mumbai has all the good toys in comparison. But, you know, how many technocranes do they have in that town? Three, maybe. And they're booked every single day, you know? Same with the Ultimate Arms or anything like that. I'm trying to find a, a helicopter right now that has got a gimbal on it. Like we have all over the place here. I can't find it there right now. I know a guy so who built you one out of bamboo. Oh man, the guy already told me, he goes, no, we, we, you hold on camera, we strap you inside. Uh, I'm like, dude, I go, there's a lot of stuff I'll do. I'll fly camera a lot using my body. I'm not going to get in your helicopter without my pilot flying it and, and try to get a shot like this. That just, let's just not do the shot. It's too risky. Helicopters are dangerous, man. What's your process for training Let's start with training stuntmen in India. Yeah. And what what have, what have your experiences been? The guys will just give you everything they got. And they want to please you so bad. Um, and they will work so hard, man. And, and then just go collapse and pass out, you know, bless their hearts. It's the hardest thing is, is like you have a vision of the body language that you want to see on, on screen. And how do I get those guys into that body language in how many days? That's the hardest thing. It's never going to happen. You're not going to reach it unless you're bringing guys. But more guys that you bring, you take away from them having that moment as well. So it's a dichotomy, right? And, and it's just also, it's a matter of like, okay, so I'm going to get on this show. I'm in this new town. I'm going to train these guys for three, four weeks, and then I'm out. Are they going to take that training and expand and grow from it? Most likely not. And the reason why is the next job they get, they're with that local master. They don't want anything that I have. They just want that old, same old style that they always do. Yeah. So there, there's not that innate form of that evolution as a performer. When you train actor, when you train the stunt guys over there, do you show them reference material of how you want them to move? And how does that translation process? Because again, we're talking about that click, right? Because Indian stunt guys, they're, they have to make that click as well. Right. Like we we're talking about. Correct. I think that's the hardest thing, you know, it is, is that click. But if you can't see your body doing it, and until I'm feeling that rhythm and that speed, I'm not there yet. And we would shoot ourselves and I'll go, okay, it's not there yet. And, and I think that it's just repetition of watching that. Here's the best thing. I think, uh, I think Chad and Dave used to do this in the beginning of 87 is they would make their stunt guys break down uh, a sequence, right? You break down that sequence, you know that beat for beat, all the moves, all the camera angles, go and perform it, shoot it, edit it. And I think that is what they got to do. I think that's a, an incredible uh, learning tool because then you can see your body in comparison to the heroes or to that movie. Okay, I'm not quite there yet. I need a little more bravado. I got to hit that because one X is a lot different than 82X or whatever. And you're just an ND guy. And that's what I've been trying to teach these guys. I go, there's, when you're 1X, when you're the hero's double, right? Because they always speak the language of heroes. When you're the hero's double, your body has to move like a hero. How do I do that? You have to watch the movies that influence you as that hero and adapt that in your soul because you're not just a stunt guy. You're that character. So if you watch the Avengers or any of these big movies, it's the stunt guy that has made that character who it is by their body language. So if you believe it in here when you're performing it, we're going to believe it too. And I think that's where that switch hasn't clicked yet. But yeah. like Bahubali, that guy, Travox, massive guy, right? Big guy, actor. I, I rarely used a double. He was so good. He was so amazing on a wire. He was so good with a sword that I was just like, oh, unless I put him in jeopardy, you know what I mean? If he's got a crash, then I'll use a double. But for the most part, I'll let him do it. I think it's literally inside them that I am good enough. You have to be the actor. Some of our best stunt men, right? We're good, not just physicality. We're good because we understand the character. We are that character. That's the switch. If I believe that I'm Wolverine, I'm going to rip your face off. You know what I mean? Because I believe it. I'm that character. You put the suit on me, I'm there. That switch has to happen. Like you might be the, you know, 
one X for the greatest, whatever you are, but until you can become that character, even as a stunt guy, you're not that character. And I think that's what it is. It's acting, right? You got to act and you can't just go block, block. What's making you go from there to there? You know what I mean? How are you reacting? You know, what, what, it, what is you as a human being in that fight scene, whether you're an indie guy or not? If I know you're standing over there waiting to come in that moment, you better be on time. And if you're not, you come in too early, you better be acting something <laughs> if you're going to blow my shot, right? Have you had any success with certain ways of training guys to uh, and women to to understand that? Uh, you, you have to show them. You literally have to show them. You know what I mean? So um, thank God, knock on wood, I, I, I can still move. I, I have a group of guys that I always use and I keep I keep telling them, I go, send me videos that you're out training. Send me stuff that you're working on your crap. I want to see it. You're never going to bother me. Send me stuff. And then most of the time, they're just too busy working. So they don't have time to train. I'm like, you have to find, yeah, so they come to me like this. Yes, master. But problem is, is when we go to work, we only do punch, punch. You're done. It's just one, two, you're out. We don't do intricate things. I'm like, well, okay, well, but you should be crafting it because soon you're going to be in charge. And when you're in charge, you're going to give them something completely different. What if the director says, oh, yeah, so over here we're going to do this. I need you to fight eight guys. What if you're able to do it in a one -er? You know what I mean? And you can connect all the dots and do some cool, you know what I mean? And it just elevates you and you're blowing the doors off things. You're creating more work for all your team and, and for your, your cinema in that area, in that region. And I think it's just discipline. Be a sponge and train all the time. What inspired you as a kid? Star Wars. That was the number one. Star Wars in the 70s. And then the fall guy, when that guy hit. Oh, dude, I'm so jealous of David Leach right now. Cause he's shooting, he's shooting the fall guy. And that's like a bucket list for all of us, which is kind of cool, you know, but in 1993, I got hired to do the George Luke, Lucas super live adventure. And I got to be Luke Skywalker. And that was, that was it, man. And that was my first job in the business. I was only training uh, a year prior. And, you know, so when that hit, there was blinders. I'm like, I just accomplished the impossible. Nothing's going to stop me now. Tell me I can't do it. I dare you. Can you talk about training actors now in India? Because you've worked with some pretty top-notch actors out there. How do you like to train them? And I'm sure it's different for all of them. Um, and what can stunt performers learn from these actors, if anything? Uh, you you kind of said it um, a little while ago, too. It's like most of the time, their actors are more skilled than their stunts. All their actors, as they, hey, I want to be an actor, so I know that I need to learn how to, to sing, dance, and fight and do gymnastics or anything like that. So they already come and quit where some of these stunt guys just get thrown into it, you know? So, but as far as the process goes, it's always about pre first because I don't have time over there like I got time over here. As soon as you land over there, like you got to get right into pre -vis. Once that previous is cleared and a -OK and all that stuff, then we get into actor training. Um, but most of the time, what I'll do, depending on their skill set, is whatever shot they're doing, they're only going to learn that. And they're going to master that. But most of these guys are so good that I'm like, okay, let's just go. You know? And that, I remember just doing uh, uh, v VTK or whatever, and they're like, yeah, but we don't want our actor to look like skilled, like you, you know what I mean? Like when you do it, I go, trust me, he will never look like me. Don't even worry about the, what I look like and then what he's going to bring. Because he's he's going to bring himself number one and himself as the character number two. And it's going to show up. It's going to be absolutely perfect for whatever you need. So don't worry. You know, I'm, I'm years of training. But uh, we'll get into, depends on what the time is. I'll get into simple boxing drills to see where their coordination's at. You know, I think boxing is like the fundamental of like eye hand coordination, you know, and blocking and stuff like that and throwing those out there and also seeing how, far, how you know, how quick I can get them winded. Because if I see I get them winded in three moves, I'm like, oh, OK, this is just going to take time. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if they're going at it, I'm like, OK, cool. I also see their mentality behind it. Um, and then we just hop into we get into sword work if, if the film 
requires you know sword work and then wires as well i get them on a wire see how good they are on a wire and see how far i can push their ability on a wire um but like i say for the most part i've been really fortunate however i, t- I will tell you this man my first job was Vishwarupam, and i we shot in new york and 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 then michigan and i did a car sequence for them and and um kamal hassan he goes i dare you to do this to in in india this car sequence right I go, well, just invite me. So he invited me to India. I had this fight with him. And then I had his double in a chair. And I was going to have him step up on the wall while he's tied in this chair, step up and do a side semi. And then land back on this guy and, you know, pierce him as a chair brand. It's it's gory, right? (laughs) The stunt guy couldn't even do a side semi in the chair. I rigged it all up. I tested it. I knew it could work because I did it. So I get the stunt guy in there. He couldn't even do it. And I'm just like, going, oh, man, I'm losing light and all this other stuff. And this, this was just on the side. Kamal came up and he goes, hey, I can do that. And I go, no way, dude. You're in a chair, you know, four-pronged chair or whatever. I got to run the line through it up to your side hip to, to get you to rotate. I go, I'm not putting you in that. No way. He goes, I can do it. And I was just like, this, this guy's, you know, older actor. I put him in that. I'm like, okay, against all my beliefs as a, as a stunt coordinator and safety guy, I'm going to let you try to go for it. He nailed it. It blew my mind. It blew my mind. I couldn't believe he was able to do that every single time. And that kind of like set the ground level for me of knowing where their talent's at. So when I did Linga and I had Rajni Khan, he's the main man. He is the legend, bro. Uh, I just made sure I did it different. <laughs> Because he, I knew he was old, older and recovering from some stuff. So, man, I just had a really good double, put a mask on him, and I had him come in for only an hour a day. Just do this or just come in and crack, you know? And he's like, are you sure? I'm like, you're done. You're wrapped. You can go, sir. He goes, oh, man. I did that with uh, Amitabh Bachchan as well. And he goes, where have you been my whole career, man? My body's wrecked because of these guys. So... They got skill, man. Uh, so that's Abachin basically has got more screen fighting experience than any of these stunt guys. Like, oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. I mean, but he's he was telling me, he goes, Man, my shoulder is wrecked from all the injuries and all this other stuff. And I go, I only need this much of you. I had John and Nia double him, and we had a prosthetic mask shut straight on. Because if they're coming to you already knowing how to do some of this stuff where did they learn this stuff did they learn it for do they have mentors growing up because they're wealthy like what's going on that, that's it you you said both you got to have money period you know what i mean for you to get into an exceptional you're not just going to go to your neighborhood taekwondo place because that really kind of doesn't exist that much and it's not like a fad that's in here you know what i mean so you don't have that culture but if if your family is in the business. They know where to get you that training. They're going to make sure you're going to go over here and learn how to fight. You're going to go over here. You're going to learn how to dance. Or they're going to ship you overseas. A lot of time they ship them overseas. They come to the States. They learn everything over here. You know what I mean? So, or London. So that's usually where it's coming from. Prabhas on a wire was unbelievable. It was a beast. I couldn't believe it. He's better than most stunt people. Is he the oh, Bali wow. lead? Uh-huh. uh-huh. Yeah, that was amazing. I couldn't believe it. I was like, I was like, oh, that's a double. And then I was like, oh, wait, it's not a double. No, oh, literally this guy, dude, like when we had the draw bitch and he's coming down like squat scheme, kind of like he's like his feet are like this sliding down a draw bridge. Right. Looking all cool with the light behind him. Dude, this guy, I'm taking him up on the caps and winch. Right. We're on a soundstage on the way up. He's limp body, full limp, like a bag of meat. Right. Being pulled up, smoking a cigarette. And then I go, he gets to the top. He's just smoking. I go, okay, Pravaz, it's time to roll. Get rid of the cigarette, man. <laughs> Come on. And I mean, like James Dean, he'll just be like, pop with the cigarette. Boom. Just pop right into character. Fully ready. Here we go. Three, two, one, action. And just, bro. I'm just, what the, this guy's insane. Talented, man. Couldn't believe it. Just like a big kid, but I'll never forget that guy. I don't know if I'll ever experience that again. I don't I don't quite understand the cast system there. Um, I know it's touchy, but I think maybe to them it's actually less touchy than we think. Um, 
a lot of actors, a lot of directors seem to come from the Brahmin cast. Seems like a lot, or like some kind of educated cast. Right. Is it is it a system where like they're just part of an educated elite where that is part of the education? Like at least within entertainment. Yeah. I think so too. I, I th- but I, I'm telling you, man, uh, and I've been saying it since I've been in that that country, it's shifting. It's just shifting faster now in the past year since COVID. I always, ca- I called it coming in. I go, you guys, even the, the filmmakers, you guys have really got to start shifting quicker to Western cinema. And I didn't mean that disrespectfully. What I mean is everybody loves Avengers around the world. Everybody loves John Wick around the world or any of these other action movies that are adventurous and Harry Potter's and all this stuff, right? Who doesn't love Harry Potter, man? You know what I mean? I go, you guys got to grasp it quickly. If, if it's female driven, get on board with it and blow it up and they'll resist and resist and resist until finally COVID hit. Nobody's going to the theater. The industry suffered like it imploded over there. Right. And it all went to streaming. And they all had to take a dynamic shift, just like we did. You know, we're back now, but they're still kind of, you know, it's shifted over there because now all the kids, they want to see Avengers. They want to see Star Wars. They want to see their solos and all this other stuff, right? But you're not giving it to them. So that's why Bollywood isn't doing well. Like all their big Mastrama and all this other stuff that's coming out right now, it's not doing great big numbers like they expected. Because you're still stuck in the old style of structure, film structure. Can you explain that? So they still have intermissions. We haven't had intermissions I, I, way before I was born. You, you know what I mean? Um, so they script their stories up into that uh, intermission, after the intermission. So they're they're writing all their structure according to that as well. What's my hero into it, you know? And also, uh, I'm on this. They're also very obsessed with time. Okay, this sequence is going to take me this amount of time. I'm, we don't ever do that. I mean, your pages is about like 90 to 105 pages, you know, and you go, you shoot it and edit, you edit it. Their movies are three hours long, you know. I wish they were um, more obsessed with time at the hotel because I tell you, if they say two minutes, it's going to take 30 minutes. Two minutes is my most favorite uh, uh, meme over there, basically, right? Because two minutes, uh, it means 20 minutes, straight up, two minutes. In three and minutes, no come, back, come back tonight. Um, yeah. Five minutes, come back tomorrow. <laughs> and I always make that joke. I go, like, in India, two minutes or U.S., two minutes? Oh, pretty funny. I'm like, I got you, dude. <laughs> Tell me two minutes when it's going to be three hours. But I, I think that's what it is, man. It's, it's learning to compress the story and not take so long to tell it. Because... In the realm of YouTube, I always blame YouTube on this. I need it now. Now. Give me my info now. If your video is blah, 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 I'm not into it. Blah, 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 right? I want a tutorial and pr- premiere on YouTube that's less than 10 minutes, please, preferably. If you can give it to me in five, man, I'm going to click on that, you know? And that's what it kind of boils down to. You know, it's trying to figure out, get tighter on your storytelling so you don't lose your audiences. Yeah, that's uh, that's good advice. It actually seems like they could maybe just take that and make series out of them, but then you'll you'll still have the same problem probably. Um, well, they're starting to do it now. So you got you know they're they're got some series over there some um that are going on. You got Disney Hot Star and you got Netflix over there now. So uh, they have a couple series that are doing pretty good over there right now. They're starting to figure it out, but you're at a different level of budget now. You know, so if you're going to do this big, epic storytelling, you got to make sure that you're going to get that ROI. And I think that's what it, that, that's what it boils down to. You know, just because you got that actor doesn't matter anymore. Whereas back in the day, it did. I could go and watch whoever the Shadow Khan, whatever, you know, and it's going to be amazing. Where now, just because you got a big budget and a big name. That doesn't mean that movie's going to do good because now your audience expects more out of you. And you're not delivering what their expectations are. And I think that's the lesson. Is there anything missing from the action in Bollywood that they can learn from America or from anywhere for that matter? Oh, 100%. Uh, I, I think it's, and I'm, every job I get over there, I have to have this conversation. I go, what's the theme of your action? Are we grounded in reality? Do you want this hyper real, raw, gritty, 
or do you want this? What did you call it a minute ago? Define gravity yeah, kind of like stuff. A, almost like Greek Apollonian. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and I always have to have a conversation because you just never know. Like, yeah, we want to ground and rally, yet he want, you want him to fly up on a wire and do this thing or hit the ground and five guys go flying up. To me, that's where the change is and that's where the shift is. But there are some films over there that when they do something big and flamboyant like that, it's like, wow. You know, like for us, it might seem absurd, but that crowd, that audience is going nuts over there. You, you know what I mean? So it's finding the, the pulse in the right moment to do such a thing. It's just finding that happy medium is where I can go too much or too little. Because for me, when I first got over there, well, how big do you want to go? You know what I mean? Because I would always do everything grounded. Oh, bigger, sir. Oh, flying? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be great. So it came to the point where the more outlandish idea I came up with, the more they loved it. Yeah. But you know what I mean? I'm like, okay, you like that idea? Sweet. I'll I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they loved it. Now, cool. I did my job. There were a lot of conversations, <clears throat> arguments. I would fight with the guys. Um or sometimes they would say, uh, Eric, sir, I think uh, now is a good time for me to jump up and do a big backflip. And maybe we bring the wire in. And I was like, people are going to laugh at you. It's going to, yeah, it'll go viral. But do you want it to go viral because people are going to make fun of it? Or right. do you want it to go viral because they're saying, like, look at this amazing performer and amazing right. story and how coherent this fight. Which one do you want? Right. And sometimes they couldn't quite decide. Yeah, so when that happens to me, what I try to do is like, I already know what they want. So when we have the conversation, I'm like, okay, they they want both. But they don't know how to communicate that or how to get you to get there, right? And that's the key. Okay, so I need a backflip or whatever the gag is in this fight. I got to find a way for me to justify it within the choreo to get them into that hero moment where they're going to go crazy and they're going to love it. And that's my job. You know what I mean? And and I think, and then then that's also too, I'm like, all right, that's kind of cool. You know what I mean? I've justified it, at least in my mind now. And now it works. You know, I had I had Dan Carter. You know Dan Carter? Stunt guy? Phenomenal. Phenomenal talented guy. And we did Seda. And Seda is about, their, it's their Braveheart story, right? And that conversation came up so many times during previs and you know, slightly bigger, and slightly bigger. And the next thing I know, I do what it's called the D slide. And it's basically almost like a, a you know how a figure skater can slide like this. I use the uh, Wonder Woman when she does the shield slide as a reference. So they wanted something like that. So we created a, the D slide where he's literally on a wire. You know what I mean? He's literally on a wire so he can slide back. But he's coming under almost like you're going into a, a butterfly or a butterfly twist. And then it will come up on one foot and slide backwards as he duck it under this, this guy cutting with a sword. It was so cool. And then he would go into the leg sweep on this other guy that was coming in. It was so sick. Uh, D slide. Yeah. Darren. Dan's amazing. Um, but it's just to find out in those moments. But then we defied gravity like a few beats later. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But they loved it. It was the intro hero fight. It was like, and to me, it was like one of the most stylistic sequences we've ever done. Super stylistic hero, kind of defying gravity, but still in reality kind of thing. That's trying to find the happy medium. Yeah. You know? I'm thinking about um, how the raid introduced this idea of, you know, gritty realism and extreme brutality and, and violence and then you see kind of like riffs on that when i you, you see this in bollywood and tollywood afterward a few for a few years where you have like kind of the aesthetic of the raid but then they don't defy gravity and right. i can kind of imagine the conversation was probably something like what you're talking about right because like how's this guy going to survive this fight that's so long Going, he's gonna be winded, exhausted, but he's still. Blah, 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 blah. It was amazing. The raid was amazing, but that it in a way it still. But you, it had a, it had the reality like you were you were into it because the guy wasn't defying gravity, and it was kept in reality there. It's just how much can one person take, 
and endurance wise and physicality and all that stuff. But I think we as an audience forgave all that shit because it was just so good. It was like our old Kung Fu shows back in the day. It, it made me feel like that inside. You know what I mean? And all the moments, all the connective tissue, too, I think is actually some of the genius stuff in that film. Like in between the I actually like the stuff in between the fights better than the fights. Right. Um, the moment with the blade through the wall, uh, uh. you know, the thing out the window, like those are Garrett's moments you know right, right, right. Where it just took this very kind of savvy horror filmmaker right to piece together these actions and find this really in like the connective tissue is quick the dialogue goes quick it's pretty much what you're talking about where it's like right. let's not make a three-hour epic with tv drama in between every fight let's just get to get to these moments do you think that india what well, do you think it'll like how, how does it get there well to to go back to what you're saying before i answer that it was also made as a breather for your audience. So you can only take so much of I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Give me that drop. Give me that cinematic connective tissue like you're calling it so I can breathe and then you can bring it back up again because it's a rhythm, right? Because you want to keep that going like this and drop it down. And that's where you can fail is if you drop it too far down and it flatlines. You got to find that that rhythm, that happy medium. That's also in your edit. Now you were saying about what were you asking me about? India? Well, how do you? I mean, how, is there is there a, a a future? Do you think where India or if if a director wants to do something like the raid, you actually do something like the raid instead of the gravity defying? Or is is Indian cinema just that? Is it? Do you have to kind of use the trope because that's what it is? Uh, I I think there is a world that could have that and i you know the raid and just all their style like what they own especially in the south you know like kerala especially kerala because they have a specific unique style it's making sure it's about your core stunt team it's all about your core stunt team and if all your core stunt team can have perfect timing great reactions moments in between you'll be sorted and you'll come out with the raid. But if you don't have this, it's all about the stunt team. And I always try to tell them that. I go, it's so important on, on you can you hiring the right stunt team because those guys who are fighting your actors are going to keep him safe and make him look good. Darth Vader wasn't Darth Vader if it wasn't for Mark Hamill making him look that good. That shows his power. And I go, and that's what this is about. You know, and you can do a raid because you got the heroes already. You sort it. Make sure the guy's young and he can move. Done. It's the stunt team around him. And you can totally pull this off. You're just going to have to cherry pick them. Yeah. Or or train them. Or train them. So, But to train them, you got to give these cats time. Now, this is touchy, but I'm going to go there. Do you uh -oh. think that the stuntmen's union in India is a hindrance here? Oh, yeah. man. Oh, man. I put you in the hot seat, but I saw it. Don't even get me started. Okay. Let's ask that question again. Let's see how I can answer this. It's always an issue. Let me let me let me let me let me phrase it in a constructive way. If you were to be able to sit down with the stuntman's union of India, what would you recommend? Well, number one, there's not one union. That's the problem. That's problem number one. There's not one union. Problem number two, they have too much power. They can shut down a production. It's unacceptable. If I come in as a foreign master, right, and I come in there, they handpick guys for me. I don't get to handpick. It's not like the rest of the world where I can go to London and hire whoever I want, whoever's right for the job. Whoever's right for the job, that doesn't matter to that union. They're going to pick who comes to set. So you might get a bunch of guys that – and to me, it's completely unfair to production. Imagine if you're the producer and you're forking out all this money and you got 20 guys sitting on sitting around over there, not even on screen. It's 20 mouths. Why can't I just have the guys that I want that look the part and can be the, the action that I need? And that's, I, man, I'm telling you, man, every job I go over there, I'm battling with the unions. You know what I mean? There was a time where all, the unions almost banned me from one, one town. And I was just like... <laughs> guys you, you can't you're hurting the, the stunt community over there it really is 
and I, I think that's too why maybe that's the crutch of of the the stunt guys trying to learn to get better. What does it matter if they don't even get put in the right spots? And you know, from Bollywood, each town has its has its union. So if I go to Chennai, be very careful here, man. When I go to Chennai, I always take my Mumbai guys, okay? Because my Mumbai guys, I guarantee at least my rigging team. I'm going to get, I know what I'm going to get. And I need them to can't get them without it because they got the right equipment. They got tech line. They got the right fully rock exotica shivs. They got Klima uh, Sutra harnesses. They got the right gear, right? And they know how to use it. They know how to use a ratchet. If I go somewhere else, they might not know any of that. And I'm in trouble. Somebody can get hurt. Somebody get killed. And that's what it boils down to. So I always use the same guys. I still use locals by all means. But I don't know what I'm going to be given from the union. You know what I mean? So, and that's always a, a a gamble. So a lot of times, you know, I had this guy and I was trying to teach him, you know, we're going to get, take his head into this pillar, headbutt, then we're going to crack him with this base, right? And he would be like, start barking like a dog and just acting really strange to the point where we're like starting to laugh. And I'm just like, he just doesn't know any better. But that's what the union gave us. And the guy's like my grandpa. And I feel guilty for even putting him in that spot. No, he wants to do it, sir. He's fine, sir. I'm like, dude, that was my grandpa. I wouldn't want him on the front porch drinking iced tea, man. You know what I'm saying? So it's, I think personally, if you're going to have a union, that's great. And they have a very powerful union. Make it one union. But I don't know if that's ever going to happen. The biggest thing is, is if, if somebody needs talent, you should not dictate who goes to what show. That should not be. Production should choose. And that alone will inspire stunt people to be better. Because then you have to be better. You want to go work on that movie? You got to be You got to be top of your game. Okay, I'm going to try. I'm going to be on that. Right? That's how it works here. But if all of a sudden the union picks where you go, you don't have to be so talented. Right? They're going to put you be, wherever. He's got to be politically connected then. That's it. Like, I mean, why can't you just go and, you know, bring your, get your Mumbai guys and do a low budget indie film. Don't even deal with the union. Uh, like, what's the harm in that? Is that illegal? I mean. So, the, and then here's the other kicker. So, however many guys I bring from Mumbai, say I go to, let's say I go to Chennai, they got to hire three I think they might have changed it to two now, but it's usually two to three guys per my one guy as a match. How does that seem fair for production? You know, why do I need so many guys? And and if I do bring this one guy from Mumbai, their union from Mumbai says he's got to come with an assistant and another guy. I'm like, what the? Why do you need an assistant? You're a stunt guy. Why do you need an assistant? Bring your stunt bag and let's go to work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sorry, yeah. sir. That's that's just my union. I can't do anything about that. I'm like. <laughs> So next yeah. thing I know, I my the the cost goes elevated. It's actually not not that cheap to hire stunt guys in Mumbai. People don't know that. I action directed Man Who Feels No Pain, and then I saw the credits, and there was this other guy's name on the credits as action director. And I asked the director, I was like, "Who's that guy?" He's like, "Oh, yeah, it's the union." That he, I never met. The, I don't know. I never met the guy. You never met the. You, you never, never even met, met the guy. Match. No, I have no idea who he is. <laughs> yeah, so he shared credit with me. I hope he's happy. Uh, you know, we're we're coming from a country, um, America proper, U.S. United States of America proper is 250 years old, and our trade guilds are, I don't know, 200 years old. Screen Actors Guild and Theater Guild is like what 150 years old or something. Oh God, I don't started radio, yeah. Yeah, so we're talking about coming from that and going into a culture where trade guilds have been around for 2,500 years. Yeah, and I wonder. How rooted are those stunt guilds? I mean, how much would you even have to untangle to reform that? I mean, you're, you're, I don't know if it would ever happen. You know, I, I don't know if that would ever happen just because I think it's such a web, yeah. entangled web that runs so deep. I don't see it happening. And the corruption, it's just. It's Chinatown. It, yeah, man. If you go, you look at, okay, okay, Chinatown. So let's just talk about China. Okay, so you got those stunt teams over there, right? So they, they work for one guy and they're on that team, right? And they don't go outside or anything like that, correct? For the most part, it's, I, I don't know, man. 
in a way, is that better? You know, but you, then you don't get days off. And India is the same way. I had to fight for my one day off a week. Oh, dude, it's so I've learned so much. They gave me one on average. That was the way we agreed. On. Well, I, well, if you ever get the opportunity to go back, man, I'm telling you, you don't take a single job without having your deal specific. And I go, I work because they do work. They'll work six days, 12 hour days. Right. And they'll keep working. I go, no, that's my max. Because I've done that continue. And it just it took a piece of my soul. And I won't do that again, but I'll give you, I'll give you a piece of my, uh, but anyway, so I'll, I'll work six, six on 12. And and then if you want me to work a seventh day, I'm going to charge you triple and my whole team. And so they're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just for our, our safety. You know what I mean? You're talking about action. You know, this was what blew my mind, Lee. Like these guys, uh, they, they didn't take a day off a week. I did. Uh, me and Dennis, we took a day off a week. Good. And I, again, it was on average, but I was like, you, you can't be doing this thing where like every three weeks we get three days off. Like there, there was definitely a span of, you know, 10 or 12 days in there, but these guys, they would probably start work at 6 AM. They probably wrapped at eight, at maybe 9 PM. And then they commute home for an hour and a half if they even go home and they do this seven days a week for four months. What, where's the reservoir? Where's the quality control? That too. I mean, I don't I mean, even know how you it, stay awake. You're talking about risking a, your person's life, whether it's crew or cast or whatever. That That's so dangerous. Why don't you give them at least a 10-hour turnaround, 12-hour turnaround? I, that's in my contract. You know what I mean? We're like, what is that? I go, that's to guarantee that I'm. you want my brain? That's what my brain takes. If I don't sleep, you don't get my brain. And that's what it's. That's what this is all about. It's quality control. If, if hey, uh, Christopher Nolan's got the best philosophy ever. 10 hour days. Everybody gets 10 hour days, period. Crew, cast, everybody. Bueno. Now you're talking about quality control. You care about your people. They're going to work harder. You're going to get a better end result. If you just beat them to the ground, eventually the degradation of that quality is going to start happening quick. Yeah. And we get that in America America. sometimes too with, you know, like grip crew is always, their call time is always 5 a.m. And they wrap at 7 p.m. And I I always feel for those because that's the hardest working dudes. Oh, 100%. Without your grip crew, you got nothing. Oh, man. What are you going to do? What about the union? So (laughs) here's where I don't think it's fair either. There's different shifts. So shift one is from six to like one or two. And then that's a whole, that's a whole day. And then there's another shift that comes into not to nine. So if you're working six a.m. to nine, you're two shifts. You're double pay. What? Well, how is that fair to production? Why don't you just call me? And that's why I keep telling him. I go, don't bring in my stuntman. Let him sit on set all day, just draining his body and energy when I don't need him until this time to this time. No, sir, it doesn't work like that. It's about shifts. So here we hire a person. You're on an eight-hour shift, period. Or if you're on a weekly, it's going to be different. But it's based upon that. Over there is completely different. The day is consisted of two different shifts. If you go to 2 a.m., that's three shifts, man. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? So those guys are getting paid big time money to them. And yeah. But to me, they're they're suffering quality at the same time. And production has to pay more money. Yeah, I couldn't even get them to get me a pad sometimes. So, so again, that's why I make sure I hire the same team every time I go. Because I just tell my guy, hey, dude, go grab me a, a pad for the actor. Done. Boom. Gone. He's back quick. So, but it took me a while to figure everything out. It, going in blind would be very hard. <laughs> no. Yeah, I learned my lesson. Yeah. <laughs> if you ever go back, hit me up before. I ended up off. just carrying the pad. The coordinate. I just had, I was like a, I was like a traveling, uh, you know, they have the St. Bernard in the cartoons. It's got like the jug of whiskey. And like, yeah, yeah, exactly. It was like, that was like me with the pads. I was like, grab a pad. Come on, man. Get one. Yeah, yeah dude. Yeah. <laughs> nobody, had nobody had pads either, which blew my mind. Again, that's why I only hire the same guys. And and how I got into that uh, hiring the same guy was when I had to go to Mumbai for my first show. I called up Mike Lee. So Mike Lee had been there with Jack Gill uh, before on this show called R1, Raw One, right? And he had met Habib and all those guys over there. And, you know, they all clicked great because um, the team is amazing. And they left with a lot of their equipment and all this stuff. I, I called Habib from Mike Lee, and I've been with him since 
from the beginning. He's smart. He's switched on. He has the right gear. He's got the right mentality. And he was a hell of a driver too. He flipped on how many cars for me, you know? Um, that's another thing. There's a lack of there are drivers. Now I'm supposed to go do this big car movie in a couple months. And I'm like, just so you know, you don't have, but like three drivers, <laughs> this is a big car chase and you got to prep vehicles and they don't think about vehicle prep. And that vehicle prep is extensive. You know, you jump in the car, you crash in the car. How many of those do you need? So on and so forth. I mean, fast five, we had a warehouse full of cars and mechanics working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Is the union in in control of uh, drivers too? Yeah. I mean, I think they're, it's all the same. It's all, it's a stunt performer. And it's literally, Habib is a, but Habib can't drive anymore because now he's a master. So any kind of car, if I was jumping a car, I was canning a car, he would do it for me. But now his son does, which is great, too. And that kid's great. He switched on, you know. But, you know, there's not a whole lot. I mean, literally, you got, like, probably three good drivers in the whole country. When you go there, it it does a couple things for you. Like, it makes you a better filmmaker, period, right? Because you don't have everything you have here. You don't have that luxury there. And you have more responsibility there, too. So, and more flexibility of creativity, so that's a big one. Like, that's probably why I keep going back. The freedom that I get creatively is yeah. unbelievable, man. You know? Yeah. So that satisfies you is as well. And I think you also feel like you're giving back. You're giving back to a community. You're making them better. You know what I mean? So when you leave, you've left your mark on them. And hopefully they will be inspired by that and your leadership there to be better filmmakers themselves as well. They, they, I'm sure they're going to learn something, you know? So I, I think that's always what pulls me back too, but it's hard. It's hard, but. The, the yeah, nice- I get emotional thinking about that. I, 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 yeah. I, cause I, I had a, I, near the end of the shoot, I interviewed all my, all the stunt guys and some of them just did their interview in Hindi. I've never translated it, but I got all of their stories, how they got there. And like, I could just there was something about them where like they they wanted to do better, they were hopeful, they were interested, and there's a system there that just beats them down. And it wasn't everybody beating them down. Like I, in fact, that the director I was working with was, you know, very forward thinking. He was like, yeah, these guys kind of have it rough, you know, like they get kind of tossed around a lot. And I'm glad that you're here. You know, he, he was very he was very he's a very fair guy. <clears throat> and the producers were too, but it was kind of those like middlemen that would shout at them. I was like, get these guys out of here, man. They're, they're, yep. they're just, yep. well, I mean, they're I just middlemen. You about a culture too that have been suppressed for how long when the Brits came over, it started there. You know what I mean? So it didn't start it, there. It started with Aryans and then you they, had, exactly. and you had and so, the, the Muslims. Oh, and I mean, thousands of years, thousands of, years of suppression. Of, yeah. So yeah. your business manager or whatever is still doing that to the guy below yeah. him. And, you know, yeah. you're treating the sport boy, which is like your craft service, like crap too. It's like, don't do that. Like I treat everybody with love and respect, period. I'm going to make sure that I leave and these people are touched by a, a genuine white skinned person, which yeah, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But I watch them constantly get beat down by their boss or by this guy or that person he yelled at, screamed at. And I'm like, wow doesn't need to be like that guys but then you come over to our place too and you, you know you get on yeah. some of these sets and you 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 got just as much egos flying all around the place man yeah. and, and i don't like that either that's true i hate ego yeah it's like the one thing in life that i hate the most is ego whether it's my own ego or somebody else's ego yeah you know but you know for me it's a constant lesson i gotta learn you know it's hard to teach what you've gone through <laughs> where <laughs> you, well, you how, how do you teach hunger? Well, I tell you, I tell you, that's a, I'm glad you said that because the first time I was in India, you know, you're, you're heading to set early morning, 6 AM and at every light you stop at, there's a beggar, right? Just like we have, we have homeless here too. You know, there's a tap on your window and they want, but they're not you know, four years old. Yeah, well, so that so one morning I, I we're leaving for work and I get a tap on my window and I look over and it's this little girl, she's probably eight, nine years old, completely naked, covered in filth, except for right her, under her eyes, but she was crying. That messed me up. That messed me up so bad for the whole rest of the week I was there. I come back to LA, I get lost downtown, tent city, I see almost the same thing. 
And that's when I wrote Catching Fireflies about homelessness. It was all because of India. Is this your short? That's my short. Oh, please send it. I will, for sure. What prospects do you see for uh, Indian action stars working in action films outside of India? I think it's 100% possible. Um, I think it's going to be about the director. You know, it's being able to take those guys, like two of the guys that I worked with over there, that I wanted to turn them into Statham. It was, it was too hard because they wanted to be Jackie, like I kept saying. But they were so skilled at it. Like, if you would have just listened to me, I I could bring you over to the States and I can do a co-production. You know what I mean? Because I wrote a co-production movie, right? But the lead was a female. And then her brother is the bad guy, right? But the, I, the females don't have a big enough ROI over there. I can't get my investment back. So it all kind of imploded because I can't make sure I can get my money back. And that's that's the big thing. But I think it's totally possible and it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. But they have to realize the game is different and it's 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 a lot more advanced as far as your acting style and your movement style. Acting number one. You know, because you smoking that cigarette and flicking it like that, that ain't gonna work over here. You lighten it really cool that don't work over here it might make all those people in that audience go crazy over there but over here they're gonna laugh at you yeah we're you not know? gonna do the, the leaf blower either while you do it right oh compressor <laughs> oh man that just that thing that it's not gonna work we'll see what's gonna happen because the game is gonna shift it's already shifting in bollywood right now the, their biggest blockbusters are flopping right now mm-hmm. left and right and they can't figure it out they got big action they got big stars but their movies are tanking and and they got all these trolls that are just really aggressive at them online. You know, well, clearly you should reevaluate everything. And their actors also make so much money. Yeah. That budget's absorbed by them. That's like you can't, you can't kindergarten, do that anymore. Co- kindergarten cop level of just <laughs> 15 yeah, things yeah. Large, 12 of it goes to the lead. Yeah. Mm. You know, that doesn't work anymore. You can't you can't do that. Even over here, we're not doing that anymore, except for something specific. You know what I mean? If it's got to be that guy, but most of the time you can intercut those actors. I mean, Captain America, it isn't it isn't Chris Evans. That's the suit that's famous. You know what I mean? So I, I think everybody's starting to realize that now that, you know, be careful about your budget and what you're asking for, because we can make movies with anybody. But the thing is, is Depends on how expensive that actor is and how much you're going to get on that return, you know? And I think we get frustrated because we, for the longest time, we're like, I don't understand that. It's such bullshit, all this other stuff. Why do you need da-da-da? It's just simple economics. That's how they see it, those investors, bean counters, whatever you want to call them. But they're smart. Now, you do something like the Joker, (laughs) you know what I mean? It's not impossible. And then, boom! Just make better movies. My motto lately has been, as human beings, just do better. Just do better. Yeah, do like a Black Rain type movie. Yeah. It was amazing. I'm kind of cool. Like, it's not, it hasn't been, you need like an Indian and American teaming up to do something cool. I kind of tried to do that with, uh, what was um, Hargrave's movie? It was kind of that, but. Extraction. Extraction. Kind of that. But you you need them on equal plane, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but still, Extraction was an expensive movie. Yeah, ninety million. I, I could have done that movie for a fraction of that cost oh. in India. Yeah. You, what are you doing making that sixty, seventy, one million dollars? I mean, where did that go? I, I know the <laughs> how cheap it is to film over there. <laughs> you know what that, I mean? Yeah, that that was surprising. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I was like, where'd that budget go? It's also like the same format as an Indian. It was so long. In every yeah. film that I write, I make sure that my page count is like never goes in the high 90s. I don't think I have a script that's over 97 pages. I got one that's 87 pages. I'm like, ah, that's sweet. Any of them, any of them you want to do using a virtual production? Yes. It's so interesting that you say that because I just wrote a short and it's based on a true story from one of my friends. It's heart wrenching story. It's powerful. Right. But it's so powerful. But to me, it's like the only way I can accomplish this is 
I mean, I can do a green screen, but man, I'd sure love to use the LED volume and mocap. But LED for a short film, you. can I afford that? Yeah, LED is going to cost you like 10 times more. Yeah. I'm like, oh, man. I have a feature that's a musical action comedy, and it's entirely 3D because we have a mocap studio now. That's right. That's right. Oh, I'm probably going to be picking your brain about like the smoke cap thing. Whatever you want, man. I mean, I'm, we do we do it remotely all the time, too. We have a whole, Dude. like, that was our first thing. Is our first game was God of War Ragnarok. And um, doing all the gameplay motion capture for that. And animators never once came to our studio. Oh, wow. Well, you know what? Um, the character that I have that's coming to life is a dancer. I could just probably hire a dancer out of Vegas. Have her come oh, yeah. The, we got the best dancers in the world here. Exactly. So we're, I'm always trying to like pick talent from here before they totally transition to LA because they work hard. Yeah. And it's hard to find those kind of people, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just feel, especially for me, even, even today when I'm shooting here in the States and hiring guys, stunt guys, you know, it's, it's the sense of entitlement that's so different of a culture than what I grew up in. And I try not to be disrespectful about it because it's, that's just who they are, but man, we had to work so hard to get yeah. there and to, and you once you get there if you want to stay there you got to work even harder i mean it's just oh, like yeah, it never ends. the stuff out of kerala whenever i would get a malayalam concept like that was always the most interesting stuff because it's gritty there's heart to it like you said i mean it's like yeah. the deeper material yeah whereas like the you know the mumbai stuff was always like marvel not I at all watch the marvel thing and i don't know i refuse years. Yeah. I can't do it, dude. I can't put my soul through it. In my creative juices, it squelches it completely. What is it, do you think, about Marvel that does that? It's like Blumhouse. If you think about it, if if once you figure out that that core finance structure and just full throttle and just milk it till it's dry, yeah. boom, you figured it out. MCU did that. Disney took Star Wars. I mean, think about it. Look, they figured it all out. Now they just mass produce. I've been waiting for Marvel to the superhero stuff to be over so we can get back to real heroes, humans. Yeah, you know? like like uh, what was it? What was the Shaq movie you did? Steel. Oh man, <laughs> you did your homework, man. Holy <laughs> cow! <laughs> I listen when I saw that. I was like, Shaq was my hero when He's I was in middle school. He was my freaking superhero, man, because I have all his rookie cards still to this day. Yeah. He was my hero because he's funny. Oh, yeah. He's just he's like other he's like larger than life, li literally. Yeah. I remember spotting him and him looking at me. He goes, what are you going to do? I go, I think I'm going to die if I try to save you. You're going to squish me, man. <laughs> I go, but I got to be here, man. <laughs> You know, he was a heart of gold, that guy. Did he even have a really stunt good. double? What's that? No. Did he have a stunt I mean, they had a guy. They had a guy, but. He's swinging a sledgehammer around. Who cares? Yeah. I mean, Dwayne got lucky with Tanu, man. Yeah. You couldn't ask for a better double. Yeah. That guy's a stud. I've seen him get beat down for a big dude. I mean, I'm a little guy. I, I fall. I crash. I'm going to probably be all right. I'm six five. 250 pounds or something oh my god i haven't seen black adam yet i, I hear it's no i'm not doing it. nothing do it. to... it's back to that same thing like i watched hobbs and shaw i'm just like look i'm happy for you dave but ah, i can't do this anymore i didn't see it what 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 is it about that do you think uh, it's it's when you go it? full indian yeah you know fast five was great to me that was the the last of the greats yeah fast i think five after fast five you got more into over the top action, Bollywood action. When you're driving through a sky rise out the window, crashing into, yeah, come on, man. Yeah. The suspense, the suspense of from reality is so far. Yeah. I can't get behind it. Yeah. You're not based in reality. You give me Die Hard for Christmas, I'm in. It's all real. Fast Five, oh, dude, it was all real stuff that we were doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like no CG, man. You know, so, and it's about heart and story. And I think it's gonna. I think it boils down to writing. There, I, I. It's really hard to connect with these characters, man. A lot of times, what they'll do is they'll just take action blocks. 
okay, we want this kind of action because this is big. This is over the top. And this is, we need a whatever bug or bigger monster is going to come out of act three so we can deal with that. And it's just that structure. And then, all right, well, we've the story in, in there. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. kids will buy it. Then you give me a movie like Joker and I'm in. Yeah, exactly. Bro. Yeah. I'm, I'm, hey, I'm apprehensive on the whole musical side of it, but I'm a musical person. So I, I, I'm, I'm curious to see what he's going to do with it. Part two. It's a musical. Oh, interesting. That's what I said. And, and then, you know, and then Lady Gaga's in it. I'm like, oh, come on, you guys hang on a second. We'll see what happens. But well, man, what, I, what I loved about Joker was that it felt dangerous. Yeah. That's what. That's he what felt like, unstable. We watched uh, State of Grace with Sean Penn. And, oh, God. Yeah. And um, one of my favorites, Gary yeah, Oldman. Gary, Gary Oldman. And every, every time Gary Oldman would show up, the whole room would kind of like mm -hmm. do this. Like, what's next? And yeah. they, they shoot him wide. Right. To just let him do his thing mm -hmm. and be dangerous. And there's probably an insurance liability with that. But when you can pull that off and kind of show danger like that, which River Phoenix, which uh, Joaquin Phoenix, he does that. There's something yeah, about him. Well, he is unstable as a human. He's kind of shown us that, you know, through his tabloids, whereas Gary, he's just an amazing actor. Yeah. Look yeah. at all the different roles he's played. Yeah. I mean, but State of Grace was when I fell in love with him. Yeah. I was just like, who is this guy, man? Yeah. Him and Sean Penn. Oh, man. Like that's something that I I really would I really wish that action directors would try and find danger again because yeah. you know our tendency as choreographers and uh, fight designers and whatnot is to like kind of fall like just kind of take the building blocks that we have and okay here's your Lego here's your thing whereas when I'm doing mocap sometimes I'm trying to find the moment where it looks like I want a moment where the audience feels like oh. What's going to happen? Like just a move, just some right. kind of movement where like the guy's falling down a hill or something and he's trying to catch himself. You no, know, just a moment of danger. I think you probably face this. And this is what um, Guillermo del Toro faced with making Pinocchio. It's creating that real element of human of like, oh, am I going to fall off this ledge? That stumble. You know what I mean? It's that stumble is that hesitation. That's that. <gasps> Yeah. You know what I mean? So how do you get that on camera? You know what I mean? For the audience. How does the audience feel that? Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think that's when it's done well. I mean, Guillermo obviously did that in Pinocchio. Look at the flaws in all that, the doll. It was, oh, I cried my ass off. Man. It was so I didn't good. see it. Um, oh, it's on Netflix. It just came out. It's so good. Pan's Labyrinth also had that. Oh, one of my, just... when you watch Fireflies, you're going to see Pan's Labyrinth okay. inspir inspired Ooh, in that. Just... Danger, danger everywhere. It was like, oh yeah, that's that's what I remember. Yeah. yeah, he's so good, man. I wish I wish we'd see more of his stuff. He's more into producing right now, but Pan's Labyrinth is so good. I'm trying cool. to do this thing now with research, and I'm just researching a lot. And part of yeah. my part of my package with these uh, game companies is like, well, let's design um, character movement that um, that makes sense. We kind of touch them on this kind of deeper level of violence where we're not we're not falling back on standard violence uh we're we're trying to understand it from a very human perspective and you know give a new language to it understanding kind of like how violence and culture overlaps and language right. and, um well it's an interesting interesting dichotomy and i feel like when it, it when you talk about indian cinema you're talking about a cinema that's just not one tone. You can't just say Bollywood because Bollywood is so different than the South of, you know, Mollywood, Tollywood. You know, the the Malayan film is going to be so much more rich and real, whereas Bollywood is going to be like Hollywood. It's going to be super over the top. You know, it has a different, it's more comic. It's more like MCU, you know what I mean? As opposed to State of Grace. Yeah. And I, and I think that's the, that's the thing. And that I think sometimes when you're given too much money and freedom from the money, maybe that's when you lose that sense mm -hmm. where you're, cause you're, if you're, if you only have a budget of $300,000 or $500,000 to go shoot a movie, you're not going to make an action movie. So, but you're going to make a movie. So you're going to make sure your characters are, even if it is has action in it, it's going to be like state of grace. It's going to be thriller. You know what I mean? It's going to be intense. 
the audience is going to try to figure out, like you say, what, what's going to do next? What's going to happen next? Man, we should do this more often. At least chat. Yeah, that was cool, man. I've never chatted with you. All right, brother. You got it. All right, I'm out of here. Yeah, leave. Too much of your time. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, man. Anytime you want to wrap again, for sure. Yeah, man, that was fun. All right, man. Take care, all right?